All right, let's get started. Welcome. It's great to see so many of you here. Thanks for joining us today. You are joining us for Complicating Chevron is the name of our webinar. And you'll be hearing today from some experienced litigators in environmental law to learn about how um, some of these recent Supreme Court decisions uh, will or will not affect our work. So it should be a really interesting uh, hour that we'll spend together. I'm Katherine Hoffman. I'm the CEO of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, or MCEA. MCEA is the preeminent environmental law organization in the state of Minnesota. And we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, 50 years of using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment and the health of its people. Um, I wanna tell you before we get started that we are celebrating our 50th in person on October 13th. So please join us. Uh, it's going to be an exciting gathering of hundreds of supporters just like you to celebrate our work and look forward uh, to the next 50 years. Um, and there will be a link to sign up for that in the chat here. Um, also, please note that we are a nonprofit organization. So half of our funding comes from individuals just like you. Um, please do make a gift if it makes you happy to know that there are smart lawyers out there who are working to protect our environment, uh, like the ones at MCEA. All right, so our goal here today is to help people cut through a lot of the media coverage and commentary on the recent Supreme Court decisions um, and help you all understand what this really means. So our two guests I'm very excited to have, um, they're going to help with that. I'm excited first to introduce Ben Shagnon. Uh, ben is a senior counsel for strategic legal advocacy at Earth Justice. He's joining us today from Washington, D.C. Um, Earth Justice is, of course, a national environmental law organization and also a regular partner to MCEA. Um, so thanks for being here with us today, Ben. Thanks for having me. Um, and then I'm also excited to be here with Lee Curry. Lee Curry is MCEA's own chief legal officer and has been uh, an environmental litigator for uh, many years, both with MCEA as well as with the Attorney General's office. So welcome, Lee. Thanks, Catherine. All right, so I'm gonna have a conversation with Lee and Ben uh, for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then we're gonna open up open it up for questions. So if you do have questions, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A section, and uh, we will try to get to as many of those as we can. So let's go ahead and kick it off with the panelists. All right, Lee, um, start us off. What is Chevron deference and why do we care? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, that'll help us have this conversation. So I thought, you know, I'll explain just a couple basic legal concepts first uh, that should be familiar to any attorneys in our audience, but I just want to make sure we have a level playing field for non-attorneys as well. Um, and then I will get to kind of how Chevron deference fits in and what that term means. Um, so first, just, you know, what are we talking about today? All of the decisions we're talking about today, the original Chevron case, the new um, case that overturned Chevron, some Minnesota state cases, they all deal with an executive branch agency of the government that made some sort of decision, and that decision is being challenged in court. So that's kind of the arena we're, we're working within. Um, and a first concept to understand within that arena is that these executive branch agencies can only decide things that, that Congress or the legislature gave them authority to decide. So, you know, laws can be written in ways that are more or less um, specific or, or prescriptive for the agency. Um, but, and some authority granted to agencies can be very broad and, and vague and, and cover lots of different actions. Um, so, you know, one example is that the Environmental Protection Agency has authority to regulate air pollution pretty broad grant of authority that was granted to EPA kind of in the in the beginning when they were first established, but it's ongoing and EPA can use that authority to regulate air pollution in different ways. Um, but EPA has no independent authority to like, you know, say, okay, let's, let's have a strategic planning process and let's decide what our next mission should be and refocus on you know, environment or economic development of small towns, that's going to be our new, our new focus. 
they are limited agency all agencies have to act within the authority granted to them by congress so that's one important concept a second concept is is the standard of review so that this is the idea that that the call on the field matters so if there's any nfl fans um, in our audience today, this this is a familiar concept, or it should be a familiar concept to you. So this is when there's a challenge flag thrown on the field. The refs review what happened, and the initial call that was made on the field can either be um, confirmed, it can stand, or it can be overturned or reversed. Um, and if a call stands, it means that there wasn't enough evidence from re-watching the replay um, to either overturn it or confirm it. So in that instance, the initial, the initial call made by the ref on the field matters. It gets deference. And that same concept applies to legal challenges. So when higher courts are reviewing lower court decisions or agency decisions, sometimes the call on the field matters a lot. Sometimes it matters a little bit. And sometimes it doesn't matter at all. Um, and so that's where this concept of Chevron deference come in. Um, Chevron was one of the parties in a case uh, that involved an EPA regulation that was um, favorable to the industry, to the um, emitting industry, about how the EPA was going to regulate pollution under the Clean Air Act. And that regulation was challenged by the Natural Resources Defense Council, which is an environmental uh, law organization kind of similar to Earth Justice um, or MCA, but on a national scope. And uh, that case made it up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court set up this process or framework to determine how much um, deference the agency's regulation or decision was going to get. And, and so it's become known as Chevron deference because Chevron was the name of the case. Um, and so the first question under Chevron was, whether the agent, whether the law the agency was acting under was clear as written. And if it is, then the only question the court has is did the agency, in this case, did EPA follow the law? Um, if it's not, if it's ambiguous, or if it could be interpreted more than one way, then the, uh, the inquiry becomes whether the agency's decision was permissible or reasonable under one of those possible interpretations. Um, and if it was, if the agency's decision was a permissible construct of the statute, then the court was considered or considered itself bound by the agency's decision. It was, um, the agency's decision was entitled to uh, all the deference. So uh, the, the courts um, gave up any sort of opportunity to, to put its own analysis, its own spin on it, or its own analysis, its own interpretation, and the agent, the call on the field um, stood no matter what. Um, and so, you know, the, Chevron was decided in 1984, um, and since then, it's really become kind of a pretty fundamental concept in administrative law. Okay, so for 40 years, courts have been giving deference to the agencies. Um, and then what happened this last session at the Supreme Court? Yeah, so so before I get into um, this, you know, the meat of what we're talking about today, I just want to point out that, you know, the Supreme Court has been kind of chipping away at agency authority for a while. Um, it's It hasn't cited the Chevron doctrine or Chevron case for I don't know, like 10 years or something. Um, and then it's been finding other ways to kind of undermine agency autonomy and authority. Um, they recently relied on what's called the major questions doctrine to uh, reject an EPA attempt to regulate greenhouse gases from power plants. Um, so, you know, they, they, they were finding ways to kind of get around this idea that they were bound by agency decisions under Chevron even before June of 2024. But in June of this year, they explicitly overturned Chevron and said that is no longer the standard for um, considering an agency decision. So um, this new decision, the, the party is Loper Bright, and that's what people have been starting to refer to it as, the Loper Bright uh, standard. 
Um, and so this case involved an agency decision about whether observers, uh, well, an agency decided that observers had to be aboard certain fishing vessels. And the challenge to that regulation was who had to pay for it, industry or government. Um, and so the, the court looked at that decision and it decided we're not giving deference to the agency dis agency decision. The call in the field matters um, very little in this case. Uh, the court reminded folks that, that Congress already established what the standard of review should be for agency decisions. So in the Administrative Procedures Act or APA, Congress told courts when they could overturn an agency decision. So if it was arbitrary and capricious, if it was based on an error of law, if it was not supported by substantial evidence and, and other reasons, um, then the court could reverse an agency decision, but only in those circumstances. Um, and so the Loper-Bright standard kind of goes back to the APA standard, which was, uh, I think, a 1940s law. Um, the court explained that they they felt that Chevron the Chevron analysis gave agencies too much power to interpret statutes when that's not what they're trained to do. Courts and judges, or in a Loper Bright uh, case, are trained in statutory interpretation, and so courts or judges should be the ones to determine what the best um, decision would have been. Uh, so that you know the dissent in Loper Bright um, points out that agencies are often the subject matter experts in highly technical areas and that they're best suited to make these determinations. Um, but the majority didn't do away with all deference to agencies. So if that's what you've heard about what Loper Bright means, um, that's not quite right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and uh, there's a lot that remains to be seen about how exactly it's going to be applied in the real world when we get some more cases. Um, but the majority was clear that even under APA standards, which they're reverting to, um, courts are allowed to give appropriate weight to factors like agency expertise uh, or how technical an area is or how much process was involved in this decision. But now courts are not required to abide by the agency's decision as long as it was reasonable. So hopefully that's the basics of what Chevron was and now what Loper Bright is. Thanks, Lee. That's a lot more nuanced, I think, than what we've been reading about sometimes in the press. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so let's turn to Ben. Um, as an experienced uh, litigator, especially at the federal level, what has this Chevron deference meant for you uh, and your work in federal court? No, thank you. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to say is, is going to, uh, echo what Lee just uh, talked about, but I think it'll be a little more focused on uh, sort of federal court. So I, I think, you know, the, the kinds of environmental laws that I work with are bedrock, important federal statutes that were designed to allow uh, folks to solve pressing public policy issues. So these are all statutes you, I, you've likely heard about at one time or another, the, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, and others. And many of these have been around for a long time. And some of them ask really basic questions um, in, in fancier statutory language, but the basic questions are, can Americans trust that our drinking water won't give us cancer? Can kids walk to school without their parents having to worry that the air they breathe will cause them to develop asthma? Um, and on and on. And these are questions that agencies have been working to solve for as long as these statutes have been around. They have to take broad statutory language, come up with specific rules uh, to implement um, the statutory language to answer those questions um, and answer them as things evolve. And the kind of work we do is to make sure um, that their agencies are giving the best answers to those, but defending the agencies when they um, make a call. Um, when Chevron deference has come up, it's because there's a real hard question about what one of these statutes means. Um, these are very technical statutes. They have many interrelating parts. And so it can be difficult um, for litigators and courts and agencies to figure out exactly how to interpret them. Um, so these aren't questions that can be answered by looking at a word in the phrase and pulling down a dictionary down from the shelf and saying, oh, that's what this word means, easy case. Uh, they often boil down to judgments about what interpretation makes the most sense in light of the goals Congress set, how the entire statutory and regulatory scheme fits together, 
uh, and what the agency and regulated parties can reasonably do uh, in the real world based on technology and science as it exists. Um, along these lines, like the interpretive analysis frequently touches on technical and complex questions that an agency is best positioned to figure out. For example, one, one question that's come up uh, over the years is under the Clean Air Act, what does it mean for an upwind state to contribute significantly to pollution in downwind states that causes lung cancer? Uh, because the air doesn't respect state borders necessarily. So if you have uh, an upwind state um, producing pollution, it will end up in uh, downwind states. And how does an agency and Congress and, and all these folks come together to figure out the best solution for that problem? Uh, an agency is often best positioned to answer that. Similarly, what does it mean for a polluting industry to install the best available control technology uh, to eliminate pollution in its plants or reduce pollution in its plants? That's also going to be a very technical judgment. So what Chevron had done is given the agency breathing room to make these judgments. It says basically, as Lee says, that even if people might disagree about the best reading, if the agency follows the right processes, consults with the right people and thinks about it in the appropriately uh, rigorous way, uh, and they bring their expertise to dare, then it often bear, it often gets respect. Um, so this allows agencies to make these calls uh, based on exactly the things that Congress told it to consider, the goals of the statute, how the statutes work and more. Uh, so that had been a pretty successful framework. Uh, agencies were given running room and they were allowed to, uh, and, and then folks on both sides, uh, industry and environmental groups like Earth Justice and MCEA could, could help the agency get to a better solution that was perhaps more protective than they'd sometimes want, but it worked pretty well for a long time. Uh, Loper Bright's going to change that in a fairly fundamental way because now judges are going to make some of these decisions without um, giving due deference to agencies. Uh, if the questions being answered by courts are these really technical questions, courts don't necessarily have the background knowledge perspective or, frankly, time uh, to give the really deep looks to answer these questions as well as federal agencies have done. Um, there's going to be a real risk, potentially, that we're going to be worse off and less safe. Um, and then I think one really important implication is, I think we've all been, you know, when you have a little bit of breathing room, sometimes you're able to be a little more aggressive or a little more, um, uh, if you have a safety net, you can act <laughs> as if you have a safety net, but without the breathing room that agencies previously had, there's a real risk that agencies won't feel uh, free to make calls about what the law means based on those factors, but instead on what might survive a challenge brought before sort of the most uh, agency skeptical judges in the country. Um, Chevron had provided a check against that, no matter how skeptical uh, a judge might be, uh, at the end of the day, the court was supposed to defer to the agency if the agency uh, came to a reasonable interpretation. Um, but now when it's up to individual judges' views of what a statute means, uh, that safety net might walk, might go away. Um, and so, yeah, so without Chevron, that's the kind of fundamental check that's gone. It, it shifts power uh, to who's making these calls. Interesting. So that idea of breathing room had been sort of empowering to agencies if they want to make a bolder decision. And I think we see a larger pattern here, uh, Ben, about uh, our the Supreme Court and a, a series of decisions that seem designed to um, diminish the administrative state. Can you talk a little bit about that trend and how this decision fits in? No, absolutely. That so uh, Lee referred, uh, you know, referred to this a little bit earlier, but I'll just spell it out a little bit more. Loper Bright is just. Kind of the latest example of the Supreme Court giving courts more opportunities to be what some have uh, uh, termed the national decision maker. So, you know, either courts or ultimately the Supreme Court will have the last say on what uh, what federal regulatory decisions will live or die. Um, and so this is particularly important for the biggest regulatory decisions that we see, like how the Clean Air Act regulates things on a nationwide level. Um, but it can also matter in smaller ways as individual courts can find a regulation they don't like um, or that they can interpret a different way. And then that gets uh, struck down too. Uh, so that's kind of how the, the latest point, but I think it's important to think about how that decision works together with other decisions. So there was another decision this term uh, that's called corner post. Um, and corner post was basically about how long do folks have to challenge regulations from agencies? Um, and ultimately the court said, uh, 
if you weren't in existence at the time the original statute of limitations ran, and the statute of limitations is roughly the amount of time you have to bring a suit, um, in some circumstances that can be restarted. And this overall has the effect of kind of unsettling um, regulations that had been stable. So the effect is not really on new regulations, but it makes it easier to challenge old regulations as someone as long as someone can find a new person or new company that was first affected by the regulation within say the last six years, which is the statute of limitation that matters. Um, and that's troubling because it can open up these very settled old regulations uh, to new challenges based on new rules of statutory interpretation or new rules of administrative law um, before courts that are increasingly skeptical of agencies' actions. Um, so they really do work together. So. You can imagine, for example, an old regulation about consumer safety being subjected to new challenges and unfriendly courts based on the new argument that the agency should not be given deference. They've been given deference in the past, but now it's coming up again, and they're going to challenge that. Or to take similar decisions from the past uh, few terms that uh, re relaxed deference to agency, uh, agency decisions in other ways. So there's, Lee mentioned the kind of West Virginia EPA case, which was about um, the major questions doctrine, which is maybe just a fancy way of saying agencies shouldn't um, be too big for their britches and, and solve really big uh, problems. And then um, the Sackett v. EPA case, which reduced the scope of the Clean Water Act on, on the principles of something called federalism, which is this idea that states should have um, a lot of decision-making power as well. Um, those rules could also apply to new challenges um, under this effectively unlimited statute of limitation. So, so there's all these ways in which the Supreme Court is cha uh, changing the game to make, um, make it so, I guess, the call on the field is less likely to stand in various ways. Um, so I think that's important. I think the other way the Supreme Court um, ha has moved is also interesting. They haven't just been trying to affect the rules of the games or adjust them to be more favorable to challengers of agency action. They've also shown increasing interest in taking up everyday environmental law cases, even if that case does not involve a sort of widely applicable principle, like a constitutional claim or a disputed question of how to interpret a federal statute, where the Supreme Court normally would be most interested in getting involved. Um, that was something that described uh, the, the Supreme Court's decision in Ohio v. EPA last term, where the court stayed the good neighbor rule, which was um, a version of the rule that dealt with the problem I, I mentioned before, which is how to deal with uh, upwind states pollution going into downwind states. Um, the Supreme Court stayed that in a very on kind of a very technical administrative law challenge that was really based on the facts of the record there. Um, and in the wake of that decision, which you know stayed. Uh, put stop that rule from being in effect, we're seeing an increasing trend of industry in certain states rushing to the Supreme Court uh, to try to stay other Biden administration rules that they don't like. So any kind of nationwide Biden administration uh, administrative rule uh, dealing with clean air or clean water, there's a, a real um, push from industry to get that right before the Supreme Court, even if it doesn't involve these uh, big questions that the Supreme Court normally weighs in on. Uh, so all these we're seeing work together to achieve, as I think Justice Kagan put it, broader goals. And the broader goals are to prevent agencies from doing important work, uh, even though that's what Congress directed, and instead having courts be the national policymaker for some of these things. Um, so that's that's the overall trend here and something we have to work against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, and so here we're talking about, we've been talking about federal law and how the federal courts interpret um, that law in light of federal agency action. Um, but we're also concerned about law in Minnesota. Um, so for Lee, what does this, uh, this Loper Bright decision or other recent decisions, what do they mean uh, for Minnesota, if anything? Yeah, so <clears throat> as you said, that these these cases we're talking about are federal cases, and so they're not explicitly binding on state courts. So, um, you know, Minnesota has three levels of courts, just like the federal three levels of courts up to the Minnesota Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court. And when you're talking about um, a state law or a state agency decision, 
the Minnesota Supreme Court isn't necessarily bound by whatever the U.S. Supreme Court decided um, should be the framework to analyze that agency decision. It has it can have its own um, framework that it uses, and and Minnesota really kind of did have its own framework. Um, it's similar to to Chevron, but it was already kind of trending or more on the the Loper Bright side of of the spectrum of deference than, um, than you know, the federal law. So Minnesota courts were more likely to uh, take, you know, other factors into consideration as to whether they were gonna defer to an agency decision or not. So was it a, a long standing decision was something Minnesota courts often asked. Is this an interpretation that agencies have been saying for years and years and years? And if so, we're going to give that more deference than if this is a new uh, interpretation that they just took for the first time. Um, is it a, a technical area, which has been mentioned a couple of times? Um, if it is a, a technical question, we're going to defer more to the agency. So like in a recent um, case that actually MCEA was involved in. So this is one of the many polymet cases that MCEA has litigated uh, over many years. And, and for anyone not familiar with those, these deal with a proposed um, mining operation in Northern Minnesota. And um, we successfully uh, challenged an agency decision and that challenge went up to the Minnesota Supreme Court and in describing the standard of review that the Minnesota Supreme Court was going to use, they said um, that they were going to, that, you know, any agency decision, how much deference the court would afford it would be made on a case by case basis. And it would consider things like um, what's the decision being made? What, what process was involved in that decision? What's the expertise? Um, and so the, the Minnesota courts were already sort of felt freer <laughs> to not defer to an agency decision, even if it was, uh, you know, reasonable interpretation of an ambiguous statute. So that's all to say that um, I don't think that Loper Bright, um, it doesn't have sort of a per se uh, major impact on Minnesota. We It's a little bit wait and see if Minnesota courts choose to um, change how they've been in deferring to agency decisions based on Loper Bright, or they can, you know, choose to ignore it. Um, as with any change, as with any new case, you know, it opens up new opportunities and pathways, I think, for argument, for advocates like us to make arguments um, to the courts to, to get the outcome we want to see. So with change comes opportunity. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a good outlook. Um, and a reminder that, you know, when courts are more likely to take a hard look at an agency decision, um, sometimes that's good for the environmental side, as it was in the PolyMet case, because uh, the agency decision in that situation was in favor of uh, a polluting mine operation. Um, but looking forward, you know, where where is this going to go? Um, what does this uh, change in the Supreme Court decisions mean for us as we move forward, both um, as primarily as advocates? Maybe I'll start with you, Ben. No, that, that's a great question. So I, I think as big as the decision was and uh, it was reported in the media as being a huge decision, uh, the Supreme Court also left a lot of work uh, to do in terms of figuring out how it's going to be implemented. Um, and as Lee kind of referred to earlier, the Supreme Court itself hasn't relied on Chevron to resolve statutory interpretation questions in a while. So where this matters most is in the lower federal courts um, and how they're going to apply this decision and what rules they're going to come up with to evaluate um, agency decisions when they're looking for that, the quote, best interpretation of a statute. So um, it's still early days. We're already starting to see some courts of appeals wrestle with the decision and how to how to deal with cases that were on appeal as that decision came down. Sometimes their their outcome is right now to just say, oh, I'm going to kick it back to the district court if it's a court of appeals or the agency to give them another chance to explain their decision, thinking about this new Supreme Court decision. Um, others are starting to kind of figure out frameworks um, that we're going to have to watch uh, and, and figure out exactly what moves are available to us. Um, 
So, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, that said, uh, you know, as, as big as the decision was, it, it may not ultimately have the biggest effect on how we do our day-to-day -day work on as litigators. And the reason for that is the task has always been, and so it's, uh, and it will remain, uh, persuading courts that the agency's interpretation of the statute is a good one where we like the interpretation or it's a bad one. And a lot of the tools and arguments you use to make that, uh, to persuade courts of that will look pretty similar because you're going to look at the words and structure of the statute and regulation to see how close a fit the agency's rule and regulation is to what Congress wanted. Um, but the so but the big difference will be there won't be the same fallback argument uh, deferring to the call in the field if you um, want to uh, kind of help the government defend the regulation which environmental groups often want to do or kind of fighting against the call in the field uh, if you want to challenge what agencies do so um, you won't be able to just say the agency wins when a statute's ambiguous you'll have to come up with other fallbacks. The court itself gestured at a few of them. So they suggested there may be still room for courts to respect the agency's room. Um, before Chevron was around, uh, there was a pretty longstanding uh, regime that's often called Skidmore deference. And, and what that regime said is uh, courts would respect an agency's interpretation for their persuasive value. Um, and so, you know, if the agency had a good idea and they were pretty smart about how they interpreted the statute, sure, why I'm a court, I should take that into account. Um, why would I necessarily resist uh, something that seems pretty smart and good? Um, and that was a particularly powerful doctrine, and it will remain powerful uh, where the agency's interpretation had been in place for a really long time. So if a statute's passed, you know, 50 years ago, an agency interprets it uh, like 45 years ago and has kind of left that interpretation for 45 years, that's maybe an interpretation that should get even greater respect than something than changes they've made in the last few years. Um, the court also recognized that there's room for Congress to play a role here in terms of making explicit uh, the need to respect the agency's views. So some statutes will expressly delegate to an agency the authority to give meaning to a particular statutory term. Uh, they might empower, in the, in the words of the Supreme Court, an agency to prescribe rules to fill up the details of the statutory regime or otherwise leave agencies with flexibility by using terms like appropriate or reasonable, which tend to be more open-ended and give the agency more room to run. Um, so we'd expect, depending on what side we are, to have to make arguments kind of referencing that those statutory phrases or to explain why they don't apply if we want to challenge what agencies are doing. Um, but again, because courts now have the last word, it's gonna be harder for agencies to defend their rules. Um, and that's particularly so uh, given the dynamic I mentioned above, where it can take just one judge who reads the statute differently than the agency to get rid of the rule, sometimes on a nationwide basis. Um, and that's that dynamic will be, you know, even more present. So where does that leave us, I think? Uh, so the question is, there's, there's a lot of work to do, but uh, I think where, where we stand is a lot of the work we'll be doing is the same, but it means the results will be a little more random. Um, just like it would be in football if the refs could change kind of how they're approaching uh, a given problem each down, um, each challenge. Um, but there might not be this flood of litigation resulting from the decision um, because, you know, the, there's still going to be these tough calls. But I think what where, where it will matter most is that where in the past industry would look at a statute or regulation and say, that's a pretty close fit, I'm not going to bother challenging it now there'll be slightly more challenges. They'll say, well, it's worth giving a shot. We might get a judge who kind of thinks like we do about this. Um, and that judge will have a little bit more room to go. So I think we'll get more challenges. It may not be a, a total flood of challenges that sometimes is predicted, but um, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, those are helpful thoughts going forward. How about you, Lee? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Ben said. I think one aspect, though, that you know we haven't talked about is um, this pattern we've had, especially I would say in the last twenty years, where depending on which administration is in office, the agency's um, decisions might do a complete one hundred and eighty. Right. So, um, you know, under Obama, there were tailpipe emission rules passed. And then under Trump, you know, he attempted to repeal those. So it was a complete 
180. And, and I think that the change will be that under Chevron deference, um, you know, courts could look at an agency action under one administration and uphold it and a, and a clear 180 under the next administration and possibly uphold that too, you know, because if the statute's subject to two different um, interpretations because it's ambiguous, either one might be permissible. And under Chevron, the court would have to allow the agency to do that. Now, I think Ben's right that they'll, that, you know, there's more opportunity and there might be more litigation and some more random results um, in that initial court challenge. But once you have a court decision saying this agency decision is or isn't, um, you know, permissible and what we're going to uphold it, uh, that might lead to a little more stability administration to administration because that next agency um, the next head of the agency isn't going to be able to take a completely uh, contrary interpretation if a court has already weighed in on what the quote unquote best interpretation of the statute is. Um, so that might be one thing to keep an eye on going forward is just sort of how does this affect some of the flip flopping we've seen uh, from you know agency to agency under different administrations. Um, and then the other thing I'll add is I'll just kind of double down on on something Ben said about. Um, you know, as advocates, our job is to to give the court a path to get to our desired outcome. And and courts are also really good at getting to their desired outcome. So this is a little bit jaded or maybe you're cynical, but um, courts, even under Chevron, even when they're told, oh, you're, you have to defer to the agency decision. If they didn't want to, <laughs> there were ways to get around that. Step one of Chevron, that first initial quest question is, um, you know, is this is the language of the law clear um, as written? And if so, then you only have the question of did the agency follow the law? Well, that initial question um, is that's up to the court's interpretation. So if a court really didn't like an agency decision, often they could get around that at Chevron step one and say, actually, there is no other reasonable interpretation of this statute other than the one I want it to be. Um, therefore, it's clear as written and, you know, reverse. Uh, and so I think there, this does open up more opportunity to be creative and to make arguments to get to your desired outcome. Um, but, you know, just to sort of complicate the media narrative you might be hearing, I'm not sure that this is going to, like, to put administrative law on its head the way some people have been saying it's going to. Hmm. Okay. Um, so an outcome motivated judge is, is probably going to get to the same place. Not I've, that there are any of those. But. Right, exactly. I mean, this flip-flopping thing that you brought up is really interesting too. I mean, we have a very specific example here in Minnesota, which is the Twin Metals mineral leases. Um, where those were revoked under the Obama administration and then reinstated under the Trump administration and then revoked again under Biden. And the courts um, have, um, well, in some cases, not weighed in on that at all, depending on how long the litigation takes. But um, so you're saying something like that might actually be constrained and that a, a single interpretation of a decision like that might be more durable. I, I think that's a possible outcome. I mean, once it, it would have to get up to the highest court to be like to the U.S. Supreme Court to be entirely durable, right? Because otherwise you might be subject to circuit splits or, or you know, different um, decisions in different courts, uh, especially at the first lowest level of courts. There could be completely different interpretations of things. But in that Twin Metals example, if that decision to either revoke the leases or reinstate the leases if one of those decisions makes its way up to the Supreme Court and, and there's a decision on what that, whether the agency can or can't do that, that under Loper Bright should be a durable interpretation. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question to Ben, and then we're going to move to the Q&A. So um, Ben, one of the things that the majority tried to do in the Loper Bright decision was uh, or at least it looked like they were trying to sort of limit the impact of the um, reversal of precedent. So they said, uh, we're not overturning all of these other cases 
that have cited or applied Chevron step two. Um, we're not, re and, and we don't need to revisit those. So what is, I, and this is a pretty unusual move, I think, for the Supreme Court. I can't recall seeing language like this before. What, what's, what's going on here and what does this mean? No, that's that's a great question. You know, so as Lee said said earlier, Chevron had been the law since 1984. Uh, so as you might expect, there have been hundreds of decisions uh, addressing, if not thousands of decisions addressing agency regulations under that framework. Um, and there's been a number of cases where the court said, after finding a statutory provision ambiguous, they simply deferred to the reasonable interpretation of the agents uh, that the agency gave, and that they upheld the agency's decision on that basis. So one question, what you know, before the Supreme Court's decision issued, is what was the Supreme Court going to say about that? Um, and they ultimately said um, the specific agency actions, whatever that might mean, that were upheld previously, uh, should not be overruled just because they relied on Chevron. So, um, so if you have something that has already gone through the court process, an agency decision or a regulation that has already gone through the court process, uh, and a court has said that that uh, agency decision is appropriate, uh, an appropriate interpretation of the statute under Chevron step two, uh, the court courts shouldn't revisit that just because this change in this framework. Um, that said, you know, it's safe to assume that the same groups that tried to overturn Chevron in the first place did so for a reason. Um, and they were going to look for ways to try and make agencies and courts consider long settled regulations, even that were upheld. So, so some thoughts about how that could happen is frequently these rules and regulations are, you know, up created and then they're applied over time. So if it's a rule that governs how particular power plant um, behaves, it will get, and, and the, the power plant doesn't follow that rule, it will get enforced against them. And so you could imagine in some circumstances that power plant would say, well, I don't need to follow this because um, it was based on an impermissible, not the best reading of the statute. Um, or sometimes regulations build on one another. So you'll have what sometimes we'll call scaffolding regulations. It will have a big finding about how the world works scientifically. Um, and then a bunch of other regulations will follow from that. We'll say based on this regulation um, from 1980 something, um, we're now updating our guidance here in 2025. Um, and so folks, and so that old regulation has almost certainly been challenged and has been upheld under either Chevron step one or step two, um, but it's getting used again for a new regulation. So uh, industry who didn't doesn't like that, they might try to challenge the original thing under that framework. So there's all these kind of, permutations about how old agency actions might come up again, um, or the Supreme Court laid the groundwork for the possibility that there could be some special justification that would allow, um, that's the words they use, special justification that would allow courts to revisit settled decisions as well. So so it's encouraging. I, I agree with Catherine that this is the much better, better outcome for folks who like um, kind of the settled uh, decisions here, but I don't think it's totally ironclad and, and we'd expect um, more challenges and going forward, environmental groups kind of now as before, can't just defend the important, important progress that agencies are making right now. There may be more need to prepare to defend the progress that's been made in the past too, um, and to be on the lookout for these, these emerging challenges to what had been very settled regulations that have gone through the court process that have been upheld, uh, there's more of a need to look at those, particularly in light of things like corner posts, which I mentioned above, where uh, it becomes easier to do that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, well, thank you. I'm gonna, um, there's some great questions here in the Q&A, so let's turn to a few of these. Um, the first one I think might be for Lee. So um, one participant asked about, uh, California has just sued ExxonMobil over lying um, about plastics being recycled. Um, we also see cases over um, um, consumer fraud laws related to uh, climate change that states have brought across the country. And I'm giving this one to you because in case people don't know, Lee was um, at the Attorney General's office and very involved in uh, Minnesota's similar lawsuit using consumer fraud laws. Um, does Chevron play into these cases at all? 
So I don't think so. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's a way it would come in. Um, you know, those, I can use Minnesota's um, fossil fuel litigation because I'm most familiar with that. But that's based on uh, the state, um, you know, fair practices in advertising. I'm getting the name wrong, but basically our consumer protection laws. Um, and so it's not sort of that initial concept I described where the arena we're working in is an agency decision that is being challenged. Um, in that case, it, we're, we're challenging an industry action and we're saying it's it's contrary to this law and we can enforce it under this uh, under this law. We have a citizen supervision. So there really, really shouldn't be an agency decision, an executive branch agency decision that's being challenged in those suits. So this should not affect that type of litigation. Because they're not this type of administrative law. They're not within that arena, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, and I, I wanted to answer that question in part because I think that um, some of the surround sound around this Loper Bright and other cases um, doesn't take it doesn't really like it's not a good understanding of what administrative law is and what it specifically deals with. And there's lots of forms of litigation uh, that aren't necessarily affected by this or not administrative law in that sense. Um, you know, you touched on this a little bit. This might be a good one for Ben, but you know, uh, one person asked, uh, maybe this loss of deference would actually benefit conservation organizations that are seeking to overturn agency interpretations that have benefited polluters. No, I think there's there's some possibility for that. You know, um, as Lee mentioned, the original person, uh, the original group was NRDC. This very uh, famous uh, environmental group that's been around for a long time. They didn't want deference in that case because uh, they thought the uh, agency's rule did not go far enough to protect the environment. Um, I think that, you know, the initial thinking is that on balance, this is maybe not beneficial to conservation organizations. One clue about that might be that if you look at the same lawyer who lost uh, Chevron from NRDC wrote an amicus brief and uh, Loper Bright saying, please don't get rid of Chevron. You know, we lost that case, but we've come to really rely on it. But I do think there may be some targeted opportunities where agencies don't go, haven't gone quite far enough to say, let's not, uh, let's challenge that. And and it will go, that challenge will go better than it had in the past uh, if, if uh, the environmental uh, conservation organizations don't have to contend with uh, agency uh, Chevron deference in the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think, this could be for either of you, do you think that we will see uh, agencies doing their jobs differently in the future because of this? And if so, how? I mean, I think they may take um, and should probably take more of a belt and suspenders approach to um, justifying whatever regulation or decision they're making so that, you know, the record uh, doesn't just support their decision so that the court can defer to it, but really creates the argument to persuade a court as to why their decision is the best one. So I, I think we could see a little more um, record development around agency decisions. I, th I think that's one result that may happen, but another aspect is I think within these agencies, uh, there's often a lot of back and forth among kind of the the, the employees of the agency uh, in terms of them doing their own work on statutory interpretation. And there's uh, people take uh, agency workers temperature about how aggressive can we be here? Um, what's the best reading of the statute? So you could imagine that they will be a little more hesitant to push the boundaries of statutory interpretation, knowing they might have to play things very, very conservatively. Um, the counterpoint to what I've just said is that uh, we're maybe entering a world where no matter what um, regulation the agency comes up with, industry might challenge it if it's remotely environmentally protective. So uh, maybe they won't won't feel so cautious. They'll be like, "This is going to get challenged no matter what." So uh, let's let's try to do what we think is the right thing to do for for uh, communities and folks. But I think on balance, there may be some skepticism sometimes in agencies where some of those anxieties about um, what a statute really means are coming into play and influencing decisions. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there is, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but there is an election coming up uh, this fall, right? I know you haven't heard, but I don't know about you, but my phone is probably uh, going off right now with yet more political texts. <laughs> um, what, uh, if anything, uh, does the election have to do uh, with these uh, with these issues? How could the election affect this? Maybe I'll start with Van. Sorry, Lee. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm happy to. So, so I think the, the, the main idea that jumps to mind is um, an idea that Lee touched on previously, which is it used to be, and certainly in the last, you know, 15 years or so, or, or 20 years ago, that there was a lot of flip-flopping um, along uh, presidential transitions. And so after, you know, uh, the Obama administration, a lot of uh, environmental rules that were mid-progress, like the Clean Power Plan, suddenly you'd get the Department of Justice completely switching their approach and some, and then it would go back to the agency and they'd switch their approach. Um, that may become more difficult over time, um, depending on where courts are in the process of reviewing those um, regulations. So, so that's that's one implication. I think, I, I think the other is just you know who appoints the judges. I think sometimes that can be overblown. You know, there's Trump judges or Democrat judges, but I think one thing we have seen emerge uh, is that uh, on balance, uh, judges that have been appointed by uh, President Trump were much more skeptical and have been much more skeptical of agencies um, having power to do things for uh, you know to protect the health of. Uh, the general public. So if there's more judges who have that view, a decision like Loper Bright really uh, amplifies their ability to carry out that agenda. So I think those are the at least two implications. It may be uh, less maneuvering for kind of a, a, tr a potential Trump administration to actually change course, but uh, the set of judges that we have that kind of can do that work for them um, may, may be increased. Okay. Yeah, there's a question here about um, if the courts do end up having a lot of uh, Federalist Society or more conservative judges, um, you know, what then? <laughs> and how uh, how do we handle that as advocates? Yeah, I mean, I think I was going to mention the judge appointment part of the election as well. And it is, you know, a significant uh, impact to our advocacy, which, you know, tribunal you're arguing in front of. Um, but so we're kind of used to that, you know, like, oh, which which assignment did you get? What does this mean? Who, what are their past decisions? You know, how does she feel about X, Y, or Z? Um, so we'll still be doing a lot of that. Um, and it may be the case where, you know, you, you're setting yourself up for the next level of, you know, going to the circuit court <laughs> if you really do get um, sort of a bad draw at the at the initial level. Um, but yeah, it, there'll be more of that probably now that judges have more power over the decision. The, the other thing I'll offer, and I, I know our justice is sometimes thinking about this as part of the picture is, and, and has been referred to, I think, uh, in the background of a lot of what we're discussing today is that federal courts are not the only place to protect um, the environment. There's state legislators. State legislatures are often more willing to pass laws that are um, protective, and then folks can litigate in state court issues in state courts that, that achieve many of the similar goals. So um, that's often another way to think about um, uh, not as great always as a nationwide approach, but often can help uh, communities um, in, in states where the, the the legislatures and courts are willing to be protective still. Yeah, that's a really good point, Ben. And that was my thought as well, is that um, as environmental lawyers, we don't work in a vacuum, right? And it's it's a poor movement that's only tool is to go to this one court and try to get this one outcome. We're always working within a system of, of groups who are uh, you know, working at the state level and the federal level, and they're working at state legislatures and they're working in Congress. And um, as you know, these things change over time, we just may find that our most effective levers of power are different than they were before, but it doesn't mean we don't have those levers of power. 
Um, and I see that we're almost at the end of the time. And so uh, with that, <laughs> I do want to thank Ben and Lee for joining us today. Um, I have one more thing I'd like to say to our attendees, which is that you are the reason that we can do this work. Um, we rely on you and your support. And so please do join us on October 13th for our 50th anniversary event, Defending True North. Um, you can RSVP with the link in the chat. Um, and if you haven't done so already, please consider um, a gift to MCA or also even becoming a sustaining monthly member. You can pick whatever monthly amount you want to give. And it really helps us to know that we have the support we need to do um, this work uh, at the state legislature, with our state agencies, at the state courts, and with our uh, wonderful national partners like Earth Justice. Um, so click on the link and uh, thanks again so much for joining us today. Enjoy your afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you again.